Well, good morning. Um, my name is Joel Cox. I'm one of the elders here at Trinity Chapel, and I'm excited to get to share with you guys today um, as we continue our series um, called Tune My Heart, where we're taking a look at some hymns and looking at the spiritual truths that are in those hymns and praying that uh, as we do so, that God will tune our hearts to his um, and that we'll be in step with God as we worship. And today we're going to be taking a look at the doxology. When Johnny started this series, he talked about songs unify us in worship. How that certainly worship uh, can take on many forms, but in song we join together in the worship of our God. And what drew me to these lyrics is that um, I think this doxology reminds us that that chorus of worship is much bigger than we often think about. And not we when we praise God, we not just praise God with everyone in this room, and not just with everyone, all the people all over the earth, but also with all of creation, and also with the angels. <clears throat> when we do that, when we praise God, and we, and we praise Him, and being mindful of how big that chorus of worship is, I think to us it, it makes our realization of who God is get bigger and bigger, and then spurs on more and more worship. This is commonly called the doxology. There's actually a lot of doxologies. Um, but this one is really common across the Christian landscape. And it was actually the last stanza written of two different hymns that were written by Thomas Ken in 1674. Ken was an Anglican clergyman, and he became chaplain at Winchester College in southern England. He wrote three hymns for the students in 1674 to be sung each day. And he called those hymns Morning Hymn, Evening Hymn, and Midnight Hymn. The morning hymn and the evening hymns were the ones that ended with this stanza. A quick story on Thomas Ken. Um, he was very well thought of at Winchester College, and so he actually eventually became named chaplain to King Charles II. And at one point, the king was coming to visit him at Winchester College, and he sent a letter, and he told him that I'm going to be bringing my mistress, and she will stay at your house. And in those days, if you were to deny the king a request, it would certainly cost you your career. It would probably cost you your head. But he not only verbally objected, he hired men to come remove the roof from his house so that the mistress couldn't stay there. <laughs> and in a surprise move, the king was actually impressed. Like, wow, okay. <laughs> Uh, so he was actually impressed by his courage, so he kept him as his chaplain and eventually named him Bishop of Bath and Wales. So, just a little point for the good guy, I guess. <laughs> as I mentioned, these lines were written into hymns that were sung every single day. For, so for the singers, they were a daily reminder of who they were worshiping, why they were worshiping him, and how big that chorus of worship was. And as I start, I actually, I actually want to start at the very end. I want to start with that word, amen. We did a series a little over a year ago called Church Words. And I almost chose the word, amen. Um, it's an interesting word to me. Um, and so I, I hope you find it interesting, too. I think there's a lot, a lot more there than I often think about. Just as it does here, amen usually ends things, usually prayers. And certainly growing up, I'm not sure I really ever thought about it, but I, like most kids, I think... You kind of just mean, you think it means the end, or it's time to eat, or whatever. Um, and even, even now, I've, I've learned through being in church that, that amen means something like let it be, or so be it truly. But in practice, how I use it, how I think we often use it, it's kind of more a, a sign to open your eyes back up and, and look up more than in, anything else. But I think there's power in what it means, uh, but even beyond what it means, in, in how it's supposed to be used. And some people, um, not many here, but some will call out amen or amen during, during a sermon. And I'm missing, unfortunately, missing my main guy here. But, um, and I think, I think they actually might be onto something. In the, in the Old Testament, uh, the word amen was used as a congregational response to give a strong affirmation or agreement with what was being said. In Nehemiah 8, verses 5 through 6, we read, Ezra opened the book, which is the word of God, in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. 
Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting up their hands. Psalm 106, verse 48 says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, from everlasting even to everlasting, and let all the people say, Amen. Praise the Lord. So just as song is used to unify us in worship of our God, in the Old Testament, when a person was praising God in speech, Amen was used by the listeners to join in that worship, to join in that blessing. So with songs, we have the lyrics. We can all join together and sing them at the same time. With, if someone is praying or saying a blessing to God, they don't know what's going to be said. So then, their, so then the congregational response, the way to respond and affirm and agree with that blessing, was to use the word that he gave us, Amen. Paul told the Corinthians that there's actually a lot of significance in that word. In his second letter, chapter 1, verse 20, he said, For all the promises of God find their yes. And that yes is a translation of the word amen. For all the promises of God find their yes in him. Jesus, he's referring to Jesus. That is why it is through him, Jesus, that we utter our amen to God for his glory. All of God's promises, his promise of unconditional love for you, his promise of for now there is no condemnation, his promise of his plan to give you a hope and a future, his promise that there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, they all find their yes, they all find their amen in Jesus Christ. When Jesus took the punishment for your sin on himself and in exchange gave his righteousness to you, he sealed those promises for you. So when we hear a truth of God, something that resonates with our soul, something that reminds us and grounds us in the truth that we are deeply loved and that we worship a great God who said amen to us through his son, hearing that we respond with affirmation, agreement, and praise with the word that he gave us. Amen. So, I'm not saying that all of us need to start being amen during sermon people. But I am saying that I am missing my amen guy. And so, you know, just for today, give it a shot. Let me hear it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> the first line, the, the first word of each of the lines of the doxology, they begin with the word praise. So the doxology is, it's a big call to praise. And the first line sets up the reason for all the praise. We are called to praise God a lot in Scripture. There's a lot of verses throughout Scripture that, that call us to praise God. But it's not an empty praise. It's not a coerced praise. It's not a robotic praise. We are called to praise God as a response, an outflow of thankfulness and worship in response to the blessing that He gave us. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. God is so good, right? He's so good. No good thing does he withhold, Psalm 84 tells us. If you, know, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him, Jesus tells us in Matthew 11. He's extravagant in his love for us. A beautiful day, music, friendships, a baby that sleeps through the night, <laughs> Getting to experience the mountains or the beach, an amazing meal. There are little experiences that God gives us along the way even where he shows us that he is there and paying attention. For the last year and a half, almost two years, I've worked for an organization uh, that does work in South Sudan. Uh, now, now in northern Uganda with the South Sudanese and refugee camps. Um, and so the first couple trips, my boss went with me. He, he went with me on those trips. But then it came time for me to take my first solo trip, my first trip on my own. And the way it works is you fly into the capital of Uganda, and then about 45 minutes outside of the, of the capital and more rural part of Uganda, there's a little missionary-based airline that flies uh, missionaries or people out to these kind of rural outposts of either Uganda or into South Sudan. So I was on my first trip by myself, and I had arranged on the trip back for a driver from a hotel in the capital to come pick me up uh, at the little dirt runway that they've built outside the capital um, to come pick me up and drive me to the main airport. And if I'm honest, I was a little nervous. Uh, I, knew, I knew it was probably going to be fine, but it's a guy I don't know, 
picking me up at this dirt runway out in the middle of nowhere um, and is going to drive me across rural Uganda to get into the capital. And um, so I'm a little, I'm just a little nervous. Um, so I, we, I fly back, I land, and it's, they're small, they're little three, four person uh, planes. And so there's just a couple people getting off with me. And I look, and the driver that I've arranged travel with isn't there. He didn't show up. Um, so at the, other, the other passengers leave, and there's a driver left who was there to pick someone up. And he goes to the pilot and says, hey, was so-and-so, whatever the name was, was he on the plane? And the pilot says, no. And then that driver sees me, and he says, Are, do you need a ride? And I don't... This isn't like an airport where there's just taxis lined up, so I don't know how I'm getting back, so I say yes. But now I'm really nervous, right? I really don't know this guy. For all I know, this is what he does, right? He hangs out at the missionary airport where he knows foreigners are flying in and out, and I don't know anyone with a particular set of skills if this goes the wrong way. <laughs> <clears throat> but I go to get my bag, and he says, where, what organization do you, you know, he knows it's a missionary thing, what, what organization do you work for? And I tell him, see the fact. He says, oh, I used to work for East African Ministries. Well, East African Mis Ministries shares a building with Seed Effect in South Sudan, where I've just come from. He says, you must know Scovia and Milton. Well, Scovia is my direct report at Seed Effect. It's who I just spent the last two weeks with, and Milton's her husband, who I also just met on this last trip. And he proceeds to tell me all these people that he knows with Seed Effect and East African Ministries. Every single person I know in the continent of Africa, this guy knows. <laughs> And he tells me that he left East African Ministries to start this car service so that he can make more relationships and share the love of God with people. <clears throat> and it was this really awesome, like... <sighs> I've got you, you know? Like, there's nowhere you can go. Sorry. There's nowhere you can go that I don't know exactly where you are and exactly what you need. Now, I've actually been up here before and talked about blessing. And if you're like me, if you're skeptical like me, and you, you think like me, you're thinking, yeah, but well, what if you hadn't shown up? What about... When the baby screams through the night? What about when it rains at the beach? What about when the meal is terrible? Then what? What does that mean? So here's what I think about that. Thankfully, those moments when we see or experience a gift from God, thankfully, those are really pointing us toward and reminding us of the goodness of God. They are not why God is good. They are not what makes God good. Do you see the difference? Thankfully, the goodness of God is so much bigger, so much more permanent, non-circumstantial, real, solid, non-fleeting, eternal. Those things are tastes of His goodness, but not the goodness itself. Otherwise, if they were the goodness itself, we'd have a real problem on our hands when the opposite of those things were true. But the goodness of God, the blessing of God, is His amen to us. It's His Son, Jesus, taking our place and giving us His identity as heir of God. Johnny spoke a couple weeks ago on the hymn, Blessed Assurance. Blessed Assurance goes, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. The New Testament uses the word blessing to refer to material prosperity or some good circumstance exactly zero times. Instead, we see blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in Ephesians 1.3. We see that Jesus taught, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, and revile you, and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. Those good things, those experiences, 
those times when, when we get to experience something good from God and, and see that he's active and aware. Those are great. Those are amazing gifts from God that show us that, that he is good, but they are not the goodness itself. They point to the real, eternal goodness, the eternal blessing. Beneath the Rishner wrote, Scripture shows that blessing is anything God gives that makes us fully satisfied in Him, anything that draws us closer to Jesus, anything that helps us relinquish the temporal and hold on more tightly to the eternal. And often it is the struggles and the trials, the aching disappointments and the unfulfilled longings that best enable us to do that. So those experiences that she's talking about, blessed are you who are poor, blessed are you who are hungry, it's not that we seek those things out, right? It's not that we seek those circumstances versus other, other circumstances. It's just that when we are in those circumstances, we can know that our status of being blessed isn't determined by what our circumstances are, by what we're being given or not given. Those aren't the things that tell us whether or not we're blessed. In Christ, you have been blessed. You are blessed. And you are assured to continue to be blessed because God loves you. Through Christ you are a child and heir of God, and yours is the kingdom of God. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Creation is full of things that remind us of the goodness of God, right? That point is toward Him. Creation is such a gift. Creation is the tangible expression of God's beauty. His power, His awesomeness, His creativity, how big He is. Creation has this really cool way to me of showing us, of humbling us um, because of how big it is, but also kind of boosting us up because we know that creation was, was built for us. It, was, it serves us. We were given dominion over creation. But at the same time, we can't even comprehend its size. We are powerless against it when the forces come against us. And we can't even, we won't even discover everything that's on this planet when you think about the depths of the oceans and all the species in the rainforest. We won't even find it all. And that's just this planet, let alone the solar system and our galaxy and all the galaxies that are out there. Steve DeWitt, in his book, Eyes Wide Open, Enjoying God and Everything. This is kind of long, but I, I really like it, so stick with me. Christianity's answer to the question of why creation is so beautiful is that it flows from the character of a beautiful creator. Nature is God's self-portrait. It is not God, since God transcends what he has created, but it reveals in physical form what he is like spiritually. God creates beauty so we can know what he is like. Since he is and always has been glorious and beautiful, creation reflects this with seeable, tasteable, touchable, hearable, and smellable reflections of his glory and beauty. This is what Isaiah heard the angels exulting. The whole earth is filled with his glory and in God. As Romans 11.36 states, all things are from God and to God. I love this part. Beauty boomerangs from God into created beauty and then through the senses and soul of the image bearer, us, and finally back to God with praise and glory. When we experience a moment of beauty, we should turn wonder into worship by giving thanks to God for his goodness in providing it, for his creativity in making it, or simply for our pleasure in experiencing it. I think we can all identify with that, right? I think we've probably all been in places or, or seen, seen pictures or whatever of, of things where creation brings out a sense of, of awe in us and elicits praise in us. But you know, you know what's interesting is Scripture indicates that creation is doing more than just eliciting praise from us. Creation itself is worshiping God. The chorus of worship to God includes us, people all over the world, but also the creation that we all find ourselves in. Psalm 66.4 says, All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Revelation 5.13 it says, and I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. That creatures under the earth part, that initially confused me, but, I, but then I remembered uh, Caddyshack. You guys all seen Caddyshack? <laughs> and there's the gopher. 
that runs around so that you look in the commentaries and yeah, the gopher is crazy. So <laughs> Isaiah 55, 12, for you shall go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and the hills before you shall break forth into singing and all the trees of the field shall clap their hands. So I'm not going to pretend to know exactly what that means. I'm not trying to get into a literal versus figurative or whatever. But there is something significant happening with creation. Genesis tells us that when man sinned, the earth itself was cursed. And then in Romans 8. In Romans 8, Paul is telling the Romans, the church in Romans, about their glory as heirs of God. And he's trying to get across to them how big their glory is. And in that explanation of, of, of trying to explain how big their glory is, he says this in verses 19 through 21 of Romans 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. So, he, so he's saying, your glory is so big that all of creation is waiting for it to be revealed. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. So again, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like, but in a very real way. When man sinned and rebelled against God, and our relationship with God broke, it wasn't just our relationship that broke, everything broke. The cosmic consequences of that rebellion were farther reaching than I think, than I think about most of the time. <clears throat> but then the promise is that when God said amen to us through his son, when he took on our brokenness, he took on all brokenness. And creation waits with eager longing. That phrase, eager longing in the Greek, it indicates this in outstretched head. Like you standing on your tiptoes or you're on the edge of your seat and you have outstretched head trying to get as close a look as possible. The creation waits with eager longing for when Christ will come back to free us ultimately from sin and death and brokenness and difficulty and pain and tears. When we fully enter the glory of God and receive our full inheritance as sons and daughters of God. Why? Why is creation waiting eagerly for that day? Because the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Just as our rebellion had consequences beyond what we realize, our redemption has cosmic implications. And the chorus of worship is so much greater than we think about. When we are fully restored, creation is fully restored, and therefore it joins us in the worship of God. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly hosts. Thomas Ken is referring to the angels here, and if you're like me, you don't spend much time thinking about the angels. But in Luke 2, 13 through 14, it says... Um, this is the story, Luke is telling the story of uh, Jesus being born, of God coming to earth. And he, he says that an angel came to announce the birth of Jesus. And in Luke he says, And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Psalm 148, 2 says, Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his hosts. Revelation 5.11 says, Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Hebrews 1.6 says, And again, when he brings the firstborn, referring to Jesus there. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. The context of Hebrews 1, there's actually some confusion in the church of the day uh, about who exactly the angels were and what Jesus' relationship was to them. That Maybe he was an angel himself, chief angel. And so the writer of Hebrews is, is clarifying. He's, he's writing this letter, chapter 1 at least, saying, Jesus is God. Jesus is God and 
a big reason why the angels exist is to worship Jesus, to worship God. But we see another reason for why the angels exist just a few verses later, in verses 13 and 14. He says, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make thine enemies a footstool for thy feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the angels of those who will, for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? And Jesus tells us what brings the angels joy and brings out this worship in Luke. He says, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels over God, over one sinner who repents. So we don't have time to get all into spiritual warfare, but there is a battle going on and the angels were created and exist to be ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation to battle on our behalf. And when one person trusts their life to Christ, there is great joy and worship of the one who made that possible, of the one who restores all things and redeems us and brings us into the kingdom of God. Praise him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The symphony of praise, this, this chorus of worship that we've been talking about, it finds its origin in our three-in-one God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Before creation, before us, before angels, before all of that, there was still worship being sung. There was still love being given in our triune God. Tim Keller has this quote, So it is, the Bible tells us, each of the divine persons centers upon the others. None demands that the others revolve around him. Each voluntarily circles the other two, pouring love, delight, and adoration into them. Each person of the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the others. That creates a dynamic, pulsating dance of joy and love. Our God, who is relational in his essence, his perfect has perfect love within himself. And yet he loves you so much that he gifts you the blessing of his son and invites you into his chorus. A chorus that now incorporates the earth and the animals and the stars and most gracious and the angels and most graciously you and all of mankind all, all over the earth. But what's so interesting is that praise and worship and love doesn't find its end point anywhere. There is no being or point that just sits and absorbs all of the worship. As Keller said, each person of the Trinity loves, adores, defers to, and rejoices in the others. So the chorus of praise never ends and finds no end point. It is continuously being poured out, even by the God that is the object of our song. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above, ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And all His people said, Amen. 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 Pray with me for a minute.